Hello everybody! I am back here in the online world at noon. Heard a roll of thunder a minute ago, which is symbolic and has been symbolic in many spirituals for the freedom struggle. Uh, I believe I'm finally online. It takes so long to activate, and then by the time it does, it shows that I've been live for 10 seconds, which is why some of these videos show me kind of just sitting, staring blankly for a couple of minutes before I begin, but I decided to start earlier. So, 30 seconds in, I will reintroduce myself. <clears throat> My name is Joseph Solar. I am a professor of African American History at Rowan College of Burlington County, excuse me, adjunct professor. It'd be nice if I had a permanent job. Uh, I also teach U.S. History, the kind of even broader concept, and I work at the Penn Museum. So today I'm going to talk to you about Richard Allen. There had been a request for Robert Smalls, and I promise I will do Robert Smalls. Uh, this week, I focused on Alan because, well, because it's easier for me, I'll be honest, because I, I know Alan's story super well, and because today's my birthday and I didn't want to work extra hard, and so I decided to tell you a story with which I'm very familiar. That said, uh, I shall, as I always do, introduce myself. One of the most important things we can do, and I say this every week because it needs saying every week, <laughs> one of the most important things we can do is to know the sources of our information, to know from where history comes from because there is too much misinformation, lies, hurtful mythologies in circulation throughout social media, including right here on this platform, Facebook. And so with that said, I will provide links to more information later so you can check and read and understand in greater depth my topic but also it is worth knowing who your messenger is, who I am, and so I will reiterate as I do each week who I am, where I come from, and why I know this material, where I studied it, etc. So again, uh, my name is Joseph Soler. I hold a PhD in urban education from Temple University, where I also earned my master's degree. It was multidisciplinary, and so I studied educational policy and history and the interaction of race and other factors. I also earned my bachelor's degree in history and African American studies from Harvard University, where I got to study with some pretty amazing people you've probably seen on TV, which still never ceases to leave me in awe that these were my professors. And so I've spent a great deal of my life studying African American history and also issues of equality, inequality, and, and, and social equity. <clears throat> so with that out of the way, those are my qualifications. Those are why I am somebody who should be trusted, not some random meme maker. Let me begin. So today I wanted to talk about Richard Allen. Uh, Richard Allen's story is a remarkable story. It's a local story for those of you watching from the Delaware Valley, who I assume is most, if not all of you. And it's a story not just of a remarkable human being, but of factors and forces that are at work in early America. And it's worth exploring those. And so I'll explore Richard Allen, but I will use his story to explore other issues in some depth. I'm going to try not to go for an hour today because the point is for you to be able to bite-size digest the information. 
Richard Allen was born in slavery in Philadelphia. He was enslaved by the Chu family, who were prominent Philadelphians. Their schools and streets named after the Chu's. He lived in an enslaved family. I had talked about <clears throat> during the English slave laws video that the English created a legal system that had never existed before in any slave society, which is the idea that an infant child newly born can be born a slave. That is literally the case with Richard Allen. He is born enslaved with no prospect of freedom. However, despite that horror, there were still certain elements of enslavement that were better than they would be later in American society. And what I mean is that when Benjamin Chu needed or wanted money, he sold the Allen family to a man named Stokely Sturgis in Delaware. And he sold the entire family, which sounds shocking and awful, but what it means is he sold a family unit together. And so that Allen family got to stay together as they moved from Philadelphia to Delaware. That would not be the case for thousands and thousands of enslaved African and African American families in later times families would be torn apart but the allen family got to remain intact which might help explain why allen was able to develop so remarkably he was not subjected to the additional trauma of family separation allen grew to his adulthood enslaved by stokely sturgis in the 1780s. Sorry, I should have mentioned he was born in, in 1760s before the American Revolution. During the American Revolution, there was a great deal of upheaval, but also opportunity, but also new ideas about religious liberty. And the official church in England was the Church of England but in the United States, or what becomes the United States by 1783, there are dissidents. There are preachers who are preaching different gospels, different religions, different denominations. And Richard Allen, here's a man who is a Methodist, a, a white Methodist named Freeborn Garretson, who preaches the Methodist way, the Methodist discipline as it was called, for salvation. And Alan is converted. He is so inspired, so touched, so moved by the Methodist discipline that he becomes a Methodist. The thing about the Methodists is that a great many of them were anti-slavery. And as anti-slavery people, they preached to all people and preached for abolition and the term is manumission, which is freeing people who are enslaved. And Allen is clever. And so as he begins preaching or begins becomes inspired by the preaching, he goes to Stokely Sturgis, the man who had enslaved his family, and he says, hello. Uh, I heard this really good Christian man give a great sermon the other day. You should bring him back to the house. And so Stokely Sturgis invites Freeborn. Note that, that, that name, especially in terms of slavery, where we literally had laws that made people slave-born. So you see where this is going. He invites Freeborn Garretson back to the Sturgis household to preach the Methodist discipline. And Stokely Sturgis is converted, not just to the Methodist faith, but converted to the idea of the injustice of slavery. And so Sturgis offers Allen and all of the people he enslaved their freedom. 
He did, however, expect to profit a little bit, or maybe not profit, we'll see. But he said to Alan, you can work for yourself, earn your money, and once, I think, it, uh, according to an account I read by Alan Rabiteau uh, in this book, once he earned approximately $2,000 in, in the currency of the time, he could purchase his freedom. And so Alan is set to work to earn his own money to purchase his freedom, his family as well. And not only that, because the Methodist way had been his means of freedom and it had touched him in his soul, he becomes a Methodist preacher himself. By 1784, he's finally able to purchase his freedom and he becomes a free man. By that point, he's a very established preacher, and he will actually preach on the Methodist circuit with Freeborn Garretson, running from Delaware all the way out to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And eventually, he will come and settle in Philadelphia, the city of his birth. And this is where things get particularly interesting, because Philadelphia after the American Revolution is the most populated and also the most diverse city in these brand new United States. There are people from all throughout the world in this city, both freeborn and enslaved. However, Pennsylvania had passed a law in 1780, which was for gradual emancipation which meant that the black community of Philadelphia, even the community that was enslaved, was becoming increasingly free, but slowly. And so there are many free people of color attracted to the city of Philadelphia because of the opportunities it provided, but also because of the religious liberty that it had historically provided. However, the economy was a wreck everything was in ruin. In 1787, the Constitutional Convention occurs in Philadelphia as a means of creating a new, more efficient form of government so that the United States can function more efficiently and be less disrupted and have a better economy. That is also the same year that Richard Allen, in cooperation with other African American leaders, including especially Absalom Jones, who becomes one of his closest friends and comrades, will form the Free African Society. And this is what I mean about Alan being an avenue to explore other aspects of life. The U.S. government that year is still being invented and created. What that means is that there are no systems of welfare, support, unemployment, etc. Cities like Philadelphia attract people from all throughout the world and all throughout the countryside, which means that there are a great many people living in poverty, illiterate, hungry, sick. In this city, where all these different people came together, people would cluster together with people like them, people they understood, people that spoke their language, people that shared their faith, etc. So you have these mutual aid societies and relief organizations connected to churches or connected uh, on the basis of ethnicity or etc. For example, there's Scottish Presbyterian churches and then Church of England churches and then also French Protestant churches and Dutch Reform churches and the Swedenborgians and Swe right so everyone has their little ethnic community. And so what Absalom Jones and Allen create, the Free African Society, is not some innovation or some unique oh, that's what African people do. They were simply doing what was done in Philadelphia. They were creating an organization for mutual relief and aid and comfort for people of African descent. At this time, many members, though not all, of the Free African Society 
were members of the Methodist Church of St. George. And the Methodist Church of St. George was a growing denomination. And in fact, Allen is such a skilled convert that he is bringing new members into the church. By 1792, so we're talking five years after the founding of the Free African Society, the church is packed. They can no longer fit everybody inside the building. And so they hold a subscription drive, contribution drives to expand the church, make it bigger to accommodate the growing mass of converts, many of whom were brought in by Richard Allen. And so all members contribute and understand that this is an integrated church. It has white members, it has black members, they're African, they're Scottish, they're English, they're Irish, maybe German, right? And when the church is completed, the leadership, the elder, proclaims that the brand new galleries in the back of the church will be for the African members. In other words, they declare that this new expanded church will be segregated, which it had not been before. So Alan is upset. Uh, Absalom Jones is upset. And so this is where things get a little kind of tricky. We have accounts from Alan, we have accounts from the elders, we have accounts that are a little blurry. So we're not even entirely sure if the incident I'm about to describe to you occurred in 1792 or 1793. But we know that there is a protest. Alan, Absalom Jones, according to some accounts, uh, Benjamin Rush, who is the prominent white doctor, founding father, signer of the Declaration of Independence, and ardent abolitionist, and also one of the originators who helped kind of, he helped advise Jones and Allen on the Free African Society. And then also William White, who was the first bishop of the Episcopal Church of the United States which was the independent American Church of England, because you can't have a Church of England if you're not England anymore, so created the Episcopal Church. The basic plan is they go to the church, they kneel in the front row, and they say their prayers. And the church sexton, which is like the, the groundskeeper or the, the, the guy who maintains, comes over and taps them on the shoulder and says, excuse me, uh, you're not allowed to pray here. The We're not sure what the word was. The African members or the colored members or wherever he would have said it, sit in the back. Absalom Jones or Allen, again, accounts differ. Hold up a finger, again, accounts differ. So maybe a virtual finger. And they say, no, 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 excuse us. Uh, we will leave when we're done with our prayers. You're interrupting our prayers. And so they finish their prayers. And I always say that I imagine these prayers were probably the slowest prayers they ever did say. And then they all rose up, Rush and White alongside them, and all the black members of the congregation. They walked out the door, and as Alan writes it in his memoir, we never troubled them further. And so what Richard Allen and Absalom Jones and, and members of the Free African Society have done is first they staged a sit-in. They refused to leave in protest of the Methodist Church's new segregation policy. And then they let a walk out in protest of the segregation policy. But the reality is by this point, Allen and Jones had been thinking about creating an independent African church simply because of growing discrimination in early America. And the early American discrimination 
was evident by speech or people saying such things as Africans are uncivilized, Africans are barbarians, Africans are heathens, Africans are pagans, and all this other stuff. And so Alan and Jones did not feel that they could get a free and equal treatment within the Methodist Church, and the segregation imposed upon them just validated their concern. So they hold another fundraising drive, and they buy two plots of land. Uh, they first bought a plot of land at 6th and Lombard in Philadelphia, and then one at 5th and Walnut. And 5th and Walnut was closer to Independence Hall, uh, also closer to the jail, but it was closer to the action. And so they decide to go with the 5th and Walnut property and they create a church. But now they needed to affiliate and they couldn't quite figure out with whom to affiliate. And eventually Absalom Jones decides and the church members decide they will affiliate with the Episcopal Church. And so Absalom Jones is ordained as an Episcopal priest by William White, the bishop, and friend of African people, and the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas is born. And so Absalom Jones is the first African-American ordained Episcopal priest, and we have this first African Episcopal Church. Now again, it's not the first black church. There was an African Baptist Church in Savannah founded under the auspices of the British which of course evacuates along with the British after the revolution, but it's the first African Episcopal church and Absalom Jones is the first African Episcopal priest. But Allen is a Methodist. He is committed to the Methodist way. He loves that it is plain, that it is simple, that it is direct, that the Methodists provide a way to reach the illiterate, that it connects to the experience of God and, and straightforward rules of behavior and morality and temperance that enable a person to find a way to heaven. And so he gets together those who sympathize with the Methodist way and they purchase a blacksmith shop and they tow it to the 6th and Lombard property and the African Methodist church is born but under the Methodist conference and so Allen begins preaching at the Methodist Church under the Methodist conference and we have multiple institutions multiple religious doctrines serving the African and African American community of Philadelphia but of course all will not be hunky-dory for more than a decade Allen preaches there as a minister, or he ministers there, I guess. And he does so under the General Methodist Conference. But the General Methodist Conference does not treat the African Methodist Church well. And eventually, things come to a head by 1815. And note, this is still a very long time in which Allen tries to go it together with the General Methodist Conference. But as time passes in early America, prejudice against Africans and African American people grows more and more pronounced, and the troubles with controlling his own church increase. And by controlling, I don't mean just Allen himself, I mean the, the Methodist congregation, the African Methodist congregation. For example, there was always an elder appointed to run a church and they never appointed an African or African American elder. And so you have this black church in which the supposed supreme leadership of it, even though the ministers are African, the leadership is not. And so one day the Methodists send an elder, a newly appointed elder who demands the keys to the church and the books and everything because Alan was up to no good. And Alan says no. And his members sue. They sue the Methodist General Conference, asserting that they have the right to control 
their own institutions, that their institutions will not be subservient to an unresponsive and increasingly prejudiced white leadership. And Alan wins the case. And so he decides to create a new institution. By this point, his African Methodist church, which he had preached, had spread. There were branches in Baltimore, branches in New York, and branches in Charleston. And so they convene a conference to create a brand new denomination of Christianity. And this will be the African Methodist Episcopal Church of the United States, the AME. It is the first independent Christian denomination created in the United States of America. And it reaffirms the existence of this denomination. Salem, New Jersey too, by the way, was a major African Methodist church. It reaffirms the religious liberty enshrined under the First Amendment that Christian people or Muslim people or any people in the United States are allowed to organize their own religious institutions and they cannot be compelled to fall under any other religious denomination or religious organization. And so what Allen does is strike a blow for religious liberty, broadly speaking, uh, although obviously it works for his own church. And what that means is there is an independent black religious institution in the United States, which there had not been before. And Allen and Coke of Baltimore are elected co-bishops, but Allen is somewhat concerned that this would seem too much because it was a small denom it was a smaller denomination. It was only five or six branches at this point. And so he makes an argument that there shouldn't be two bishops, should only be one bishop. And so Koch resigns, or there's a new election held again. Accounts differ, but Allen is elected as the first bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church in the United States. And Philadelphia's Bethel Church becomes Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church at 6th and Lombard, where it still stands today, though not the original shop. They continuously, just like the Methodist St. George Church, as Allen attracts more and more members, they keep having to expand and expand and expand and today at 6th and Lombard, the Mother Bethel Church is from 1889 that stands there. It becomes the centerpiece of black life in Philadelphia. And in fact, 6th and Lombard, that neighborhood is an African-American neighborhood in Philadelphia for generations. But Allen's activities are not exclusively devoted to religion. Uh, in fact, while he was preaching, at the AME, well, at the Methodist Church before it became AME, he was a business guy. And so he's making money and he's helping to fund the church and he's keeping the church alive with his own funds and with his own money until, of course, it has more of an independent structure and then he becomes the bishop of it, at which point he is burdened with extra work because <laughs> he now has to run the entire denomination. And he is aided in this by his second wife, Sarah Allen. His first wife, Flora, had died in childbirth earlier. Or not in childbirth, I'm sorry. Had died. Um, I don't know if it was in childbirth. And so his, his second wife helps. And this is also important because it means that from the very founding of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Black women are the church ladies helping to run the show, helping to administrate the business of church affairs, <clears throat> including no doubt helping when the Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church plays host to the Negro Convention regarding colonization. Uh, in short, I'll probably do another episode on colonization and explore this issue a little in, in greater depth, but they hold the first 
Negro convention. Uh, by this point, the term Negro being more conventionally accepted to describe African Americans as opposed to Africans, as opposed to Haitians, etc. Um, incidentally, Allen sends a mission to Haiti, and so in Port-au-Prince by 1816, there is an African Methodist Episcopal Church in Haiti. But the convention in Philadelphia will attract some 3,000 people who will gather together and produce a document that rejects the notion of colonization. Again, I'll probably do an episode on that maybe next week. Although, don't worry, Robert Smalls fans, Smalls is still on tap. And so this organization, this institution becomes the center of black life and a national and nationally important institution. And those of you who, who are African-American or familiar with African-American history know that it is within black churches that the civil rights movement, that abolitionism, that a lot of the great social progress and social support within the black community emerges. And Mother Bethel sets the foundation for this. And in fact, Allen will live until 1831. And he will continue to play a prominent role helping to organize black institutional life and supporting black causes within the brand new United States of America. And in fact, by 1830, they will host the first National Negro Convention, which will ultimately lead the following year to the founding of the American Abolition Society, which will be the national organization moving for the abolition of slavery in the United States. And Allen will not live to see its full flowering, but as a 70-year-old, he will preside over the meeting of this first National Negro Convention at Mother Bethel, at which the individuals who will ultimately form the American Abolition Society come together to meet and to discuss issues related to the, quote, Negro community throughout the United States, both free and enslaved. One thing I will add, I'll add a couple little tidbits uh, again, I could go on and on. Richard Allen is, there are so many things that Richard Allen involves himself with. Uh, yellow fever in Philadelphia in 1793, colonization, the Abolition Society. But the second largest congregation is of the African Methodist Episcopal Church is the Mother Emanuel congregation in Charleston, South Carolina. And Mother Emanuel is where Denmark Vesey, a preacher and free man of color, will hatch a conspiracy in 1822 against slavery in South Carolina. And that conspiracy will be betrayed and suppressed and Denmark VC will be executed and after 1822 the state of South Carolina will suppress and dissolve the Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston in violation of the First Amendment. That church will be reborn after the Civil War. Richard Harvey Kane, a, a Brooklyn <clears throat> African Methodist Episcopal preacher will help bring back the Mother Emmanuel uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church. But uh, tragically, the Mother Emmanuel AME Church is where the mass killing took place a few years ago after Bible study. Um, so it is a site of tragedy but it's a site of resilience because that's the church, the second church. That is the church that is spread from Philadelphia, that houses a conspirator, 
but inspires others and does not stay down for long. And I like to think of that kind of as a metaphor that Richard Allen creates this institution, this African Methodist Episcopal Church, which affirms religious liberty in the United States, but also is indicative of a need to create independent black institutions in light of a racist society, but that nonetheless has persisted and persisted and persisted till this day. Uh, and I actually visited and took the full tour of Mother Bethel uh, a couple of months ago and, and, and visited Alan's grave. He's buried there with his wife underneath the church. And it has been an institution that has been at the forefront of leading the black community and leading the struggle for equality and even when it has been suppressed or attacked, it has been an institution which has persisted to this day, providing inspiration and leadership, not just within the black community, but setting an example of what is possible and the liberties that are possible within an expansive reading of American freedom. So, I said I was going to try to keep this a little shorter, so it would be a little more bite-sized. So I'm going to end it here, understanding that there's a few more topics that I've already introduced that I can explore in the coming weeks, whether it be colonization or Denmark VC or etc. So if anyone has any questions for me, I will take them now. And don't worry, Robert Smalls is still there. Oh, and thank you for the birthday wishes, my friends. I am very grateful to you for that. I am having a simple day. I'm going to go food shopping and make myself a nice dinner. But any questions out there about Richard Allen? Like I said, I will provide you links to more information. Uh, unfortunately for my own mind right now, there's about 10 different things. But if I talk about every last thread in my mind, we'll be here for three or four hours and I couldn't do that to you. So any questions as I try to shorten these a bit to make them easier on you all. I'll give you 40 seconds till the 38th minute of this. Uh, I will show you actually again this book, Black Leaders of the 19th Century, edited by Leon Litwack and August Meyer, has a nice little piece about Richard Allen uh, by Alan Rabiteau. What is interesting about this book is it's from the late 80s, and so a lot of the information in here has been, let's say, improved upon by subsequent scholarship. And so we actually know more about Richard Allen today than we did when this book was published in 1987, which is fascinating. Also, there are several documents by Richard Allen, including related to the yellow fever, in this book, which is a documentary history of the Negro people in the United States, edited by Herbert Apthicker. And this book is part of a six volume series dating back to the 50s. But the editor, Herbert Apthicker, was, let's say, oppressed a little in the United States because he had communist sympathies that said, this is one of the collections, the great collections of firsthand accounts by African Americans that is available uh, still to this day. And we can thank Apthicker for putting these documents together. And so, so just my final thoughts, thank you friends, is that future topics besides Robert Smalls, I still got you Jay, I promise. Uh, there is the topic of the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia, which I might discuss in the next week or two weeks, and the issue of the colonization movement in the United States, which might have to be a two-parter and involve some other important kick-butt Philadelphians. Okay? Alrighty, let's call it a day at 40 minutes. Woohoo! 20 minutes shorter so you all can get on with your lives and not feel trapped by me. Have a wonderful day, everybody, and uh, I'm gonna I'll post up some information. 
<laughs> Jay, I adore you. Uh, yes, definitely, Lynn. You can run by any names, information whatsoever, and I'll definitely get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people worth researching for sure. So I'll run some. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you some names for sure. Oh, there's so much. So much. So, yeah. You can either post in comments or you can write to the Educating for Change message board and I'll respond there. But I'm going to post a little, some, some Richard Allen links and some other Bethel links, too. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. That's very kind. Gosh, there's so much. So much to cover. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. I actually had passages. I was like, let me read them to you. But I don't even have to read them to you. There's just... Yeah. Yeah, there's tons. tons to cover so many important people uh, I will say this pat myself on the back a little bit uh, I've, I've given I gave a talk kind of to a tour group outside Mother Bethel one time and uh, the the docents at Mother Bethel one of them anyway uh, she came out <laughs> and she heard me talking and she came and sat in uh, so that and uh, she said she learned a couple of things so that was very flattering. So then, of course, I had to go to Mother Bethel to learn from them. And so we engaged in a mutual exchange of information and helped improve each other, which is wonderful because we should always go forth humbly, which, of course, was part of Richard Allen's general demeanor as an individual was that we should go forth humbly and simply. And he considered it a cornerstone of his Methodist faith. All righty. <laughs> oh jay but i want to leave you wanting more so you keep coming back each wednesday all righty so just 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 to reiterate we got three topics coming up for certain. Representative Robert Smalls of South Carolina from Beaufort and his fantastic story. But I got to do a little more research on his congressional career before I feel comfortable to do that. I know his incredible escape from slavery story, but I'm not sure that is sufficient to fill. And then also the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia which is a turning point in black community life and also has a Richard Allen piece, and then also the colonization movement, which involves some other important people like Paul Cuffey and James Fortin, who themselves could qualify for their own episodes. So we're starting to unpack all of the amazing stories now um, that exist and all of the amazing African and African-American people who have helped build our society and help define what it is to be an American. All righty, I'm going to call it <laughs> so that I can, um, well, so I can get out food shop and I'm hungry, but also so that you all can get on for your day. And uh, so I have time to put some links up so that you have more information to read up on these stories and these people and these issues as well Alrighty, so i'm gonna say goodbye my friends for now i'm gonna call it a day i hope you have a wonderful saturday uh saturday wednesday even though the rains are coming which the rains always come because it's my birthday so i will talk to you soon and uh definitely be sure to check in on the links so have a great day everyone oh stubby says hello is my kitty. I will talk to you soon. Goodbye, all. <laughs>